<laughs> Welcome, EJ Sansom, to Wealth Matters Podcast. How are you today? Doing well. How about yourself? Good. Thank you. So I already gave some intro about you, but can you give us a brief intro? Sure. Yeah. I, I'm EJ Sansom from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I'm a real estate developer, um, as I tell most people, but um, my background is in, in law. I was a practicing attorney for about four years and worked for a uh, large multifamily developer. We developed mostly in the Southeast. Um, and I did that for about four years and then decided to start my own development and investment company. A company is called Edgewater Real Estate Development. And then from there, I, I went on to get my broker's license because I like having as many tools in the toolbox as possible. Um, so I, I picked up my broker's license and just recently started a brokerage. Wow. So that's kind of where I am right now. Um, you know, development, investments, and, and brokering transactions. That's interesting. I have yet to meet someone who is an attorney, then a developer, a realtor broker. Pretty interesting. But I think it makes from the transition side because you work for a multifamily development company. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was an easy transition. Um, you know, I kind of learned the nuts and bolts of real estate transactions um, through my job at, at that development company. Um, because I was involved with developing, um, you know, from the very beginning with land acquisition um, through the closing stages and raising equity um, and structuring the deal. And then even after that, uh, you know, had to keep tabs on um, construction. I wasn't um, in the general contracting myself, um, but obviously as the developer, you have to monitor the process. Right. Everybody's kind of doing what they need to do. Um, and then even on from there uh, into property management and asset management, because a lot of the assets that we built um, were held and managed uh, for long after the sale. I see. So uh, what was your first real estate deal? Was that a development or buy and hold? Or? Yeah, so um, my first real estate development um, was what many would consider a failure. Um, I, I put a deal together. It was a small town home development. It was an infill deal in an urban neighborhood, um, which I like infill deals. And it was kind of on the line of progress. So it had a lot of you know, really neat qualities to it. It was a historic neighborhood. Um, so I, I chose that as my first development. So it was going to be a for sale town home development, um, which had a lot um, of risk to it, um, probably more um, than I should have uh, accepted as on my first deal, you know, you want to make sure that you have some success right out of the gate. Um, right. But it was a really risky deal. It required us to get pre-sales of the units. I learned how difficult that is through the process. So in the end, you know, we, we invested a considerable amount of money in trying to get the project off the ground and, and it never did. So uh, luckily I didn't get stuck with the land because I structured it as an, as an option contract or a contingent contract. Oh, I see. Yeah, so that allowed that allowed me to do my my due diligence without being fully committed to the land. We did spend some money and end up losing it, but we didn't have right. the land. We were able to walk away. And I would recommend that any developer that is considering a development project do just that and make sure that your contract is structured so that you can essentially opt out in your sole discretion. Um, you know, if you if you find that the development that you want to do there is not suitable. That's a great tip. Uh, so why did you choose a real estate when you were already a successful attorney? Well, I always knew that I wanted to be in real estate. And honestly, I went into real or I went into to law um, with the objective of, of gaining a, a transactional knowledge um, of the law. I wasn't, you know, I, did, I didn't go to law school with dreams of being a litigation attorney. I went, I went to law school with the dreams of doing big deals. Um, so I, I, I got lucky right out of the gate and found my way into a great um, in-house legal position with a developer, which I kind of just hit the jackpot there. Yeah. Uh, and so again, I just kind of got some great, some great training in those several years and got to the point where I just felt like I could do it on my own. Yeah. You can't beat on the job learning, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just kind of got thrown into it and, you know, it was very much sink or swim and, you know, sinking is not an option. So yep. learned on the fly and um, yeah, I enjoyed everything that I learned. It was a very valuable education. Yeah. Sink is not an option for people who are resilient, right? Absolutely. That is right. <laughs> so you mentioned you are a developer. 
Can you elaborate on that? Because I want to make sure my listeners understand. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, like I alluded to, I think that the term developer is pretty broad. Yes. Um, but I guess if you were to define it, it would be someone who buys land and builds on it. Um, or it could be somebody who buys real estate that is very distressed um, and needs major renovations or something of that nature. Um, so then, you know, you're essentially adding extreme value to something that has, uh, you know, much less value. Um, and, you know, that begins with entitlements and, and doing things that you can't even see on the land. So, if, you know, if there's a zoning change or something that needs to happen, you've added value there. Um, you know, that may be the good time to, to sell out of it if you find the right price. Um, then maybe you can take it a step further and start actually planning something. And then ultimately, if it's a development that you're going to see through to the end, you know, you've got to, you got to build or redevelop. Yes. Now that helps. So um, I understood that your first real estate deal, of course, you end up losing money. So what lessons did you learn? I know we got the first tip that you want to make sure that you are able to assign the contract, but was there any other lesson? Yeah. Don't lose money. <laughs> uh, that's, no, no, that that's is rule number point. one. That's a great point. But I, I look those uh, losing money as an experience and it, you pay for your education somewhere, somehow. And as long as you take something out of it, even when you lose money and you do not repeat that mistake, then that was your education. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't change a thing. I, I learned a lot, like you said. Um, but yeah, I mean, you should always really know what you're getting yourself into. Um, you know, if anybody ever wants to uh, check out my story in the Resilience book, which we co-authored together, it'll, it'll give a brief history of how I got out on my own. But um, the, the short part of it is I ended up getting fired from my job um, and kind of got thrown into uh, what I'm doing now because you know, it was either get another job or go back to work. So I was kind of looking at this development um, before I, I lost my job. And then when I lost my job, I went, you know, kind of all in on that. Um, so I probably stuck with it longer than I should have um, and probably invested more money into it than I should have. Um, after I was faced with a lot of challenges that we did overcome, you know, I was kind of always trying to find a solution. Um, and I find that if you're having to work really hard to find a solution or you're trying to convince yourself of things that, um, you know, it's probably not a great deal. I the, see. Good, the good ones scream good, you know, you, you know, them. Um, right. but I, that was my biggest takeaway there from, from that, uh, that, um, situation was, you know, knowing, knowing what's a good deal, knowing what's a bad deal and when to walk away. Yeah. Thanks for sharing those golden nuggets. So I understand your first deal was a disaster. So did you, uh, how was your second deal? I was, it was successful, um, much more successful. Um, so, you know, I, the, the second deal was a lot less risky. Um, you know, and I knew after that, that deal that I had put together initially that I wanted to do something with less risk. So um, the second time around, we took an existing development that was distressed um, and we infused capital into it and made improvements, um, and then resold it after we had completed our redevelopment, um, and, you know, obviously made a nice profit on that. So it was successful. That's awesome. So let's, uh, talk about development because I want to focus on, cause even I haven't done any development. Can you tell us more about the type of team members would I need if I don't have any background in construction, civil engineering, architecture? Pretty much I don't know anything about uh, developing, but I do want to develop. Uh, can you give us, give us an idea? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that, you know, you, you can't do it all. Um, development is, um, you know, it takes a lot of people. Real estate in general is a team sport. Yeah. Um, development even more so because there's just so many moving parts. Um, really the developer's job is to kind of be the general manager of the deal. Um, you know, you're putting the key people where they need to be, you're building the team and you're making sure that everything stays on track. Um, but you can't, if you're doing all of those things, you can't, you can't be working, you know, too deep into the business. Maybe you have one skill set that that's really applicable and you bring that to the table. So you focus on that as well. But in general, you want to delegate all the other pieces to others. Right. So, 
you know, the team members that you want to have um, for sure on any development deal um, is going to be initially a civil engineer. Okay. Um, what a civil engineer is going to do is, you know, they're, they're going to get involved with you from the very beginning with the land, um, tell you, you know, generally what kind of earthwork needs to be done, help you out with utility plans. Um, they, they usually can do the surveying um, on the front end as well. So really kind of helping you put together a plan for the property from the ground up. Um, so they're definitely an important team member and they usually work really closely uh, with an architect and the architect is is more design and vertical construction um, is what we call it but you know once you're once you're getting off the ground your architects going to design most of that um, and obviously in conjunction with a structural engineer so you got a civil engineer structural engineer and an architect um, and then um, you know the kind of rounding out the the build team is is your general contractor right of course manager so and what's the what's the difference between uh, civil engineer structural engineer and architect right I, I thought they could all be one person but it seems that they all have different duties or responsibilities in this game yeah absolutely um and it does you know it's kind of there's a lot of uh, probably overlap i would say between those people some of them have um, multiple skill sets and right. rarely would you probably find somebody that had all three of those skill sets. Um, but you know, an architect can be an engineer um, or vice versa, but really the architect's job is design. Um, you know, they're, they're helping with aesthetics and making sure that it's laid out properly. Um, the civil engineer's job is to uh, help you with all like building systems, electricity, mechanical plumbing, and then also, you know, helping you lay out the site schematically. And then the structural engineer's job is to make sure that what the architect is designing can actually be built. Um, I see. So, you know, they're, they're doing all the stress tests and that kind of things, telling you, you know, where your load bearing walls need to be and how, you know, how deep your footings need to be, that kind of stuff. I see. So the structure, would that structure hold, right? Exactly. Because, you know, an architect, I mean, sure, they have some, some knowledge of engineering, but if they're not an engineer, they, they may not be looking at all of, of those things so they can draw something that looks absolutely fabulous. But, you know, your engineer has got to sign off on the plans and say, yeah, this is how we can build it and it can be built. I see. And what are the other team members? Oh. Yeah, so um, I mentioned the general contractor. Obviously, they're key. Right. And, they are the most important, actually. After yeah. Once you have f figured out what you need to build and how you are going to build it, then you know, of course you need to build it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's where the general contractor comes in. A lot of developers may, may be general contractors as well. I'm not, I, I outsource everything. Again, I just try to stick to my core competencies. Um, so I, I just offload that. It's, I mean, that's a very time intensive job. So general contractor yes. can make or break a job, you know, whether they run their, their crews efficiently, you know, whether they're staying on budget. So definitely make sure you vet your general contractor and get a good one. And depending on the asset type, you know, there may be different general contractors that, that build that sort of product. So right. get referrals, find a good one, and then get them involved early to help you cost everything out. Um, but then kind of moving on from there, um, you're going to need an attorney most likely, um, you know, to help you structure the deal. Right. There's documentation and review um, that's going to happen on a large development project. Um, so you definitely want to have an attorney um, on hand. Uh, title company, obviously, they're going to be involved yes. with the land acquisition and, you know, pulling titles, make sure that you've got clean title, um, and then ultimately providing you with title insurance as well. Um, and sometimes even a title company um, on a deal will, will handle dispersing as well. So if you're borrowing money or you have private capital, um, you know, you hold that in escrow and then you have to submit draws for the money and show how the funds are being allocated. And then the title company will will release the money to you. And, you know, again, it sounds like, oh, a title company is probably not that important, but it really is. Oh, you yeah. know, that, that job is an important one and you want to make sure that they're responsive. You know, if, if you put in a pay request and don't get it for two days, like you're going to have some, some upset yes. contractors that are going to want to walk off your job. So get a good responsive title company. Yeah, and this is not a small rehab or something you're developing, right? So you want to make sure your contractor is happy or, or con subcontractors are happy. <laughs> yeah, the general contractor's got to pay his guys. If you don't pay him, he can't pay anybody. Right. So there's a trickle-down effect. So, um, yeah, that's exactly why you got to keep everything on track and keep everyone happy. Yep. 
Um, and then from there, um, you know, if, if you're going to be holding on to the asset, you want to have a property manager on standby um, to help you manage. And again, if, if this is um, a project that you're going to hold, say multifamily housing, you know, you want to get your property manager lined up. Right. You don't, you don't want to wait till you're, you're finished with construction to have your property manager involved. You know, you want them in as early as possible to help you figure out what your rents are going to be and, you know, get everything off the ground. And even yeah. many times you'll want to be pre-leasing before you're even done. Right. And they may be even giving you some advice on the amenities, you know, uh, you could offer or you should offer for that area, right? Depending on if it's A class area, B class neighborhood and what other apartments in the, you know, within half a mile or a mile are offering, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's a huge part of the diligence process is making sure that, you know, whatever rents that you need to get in order to have this project, um, you know, be successful, like, can you actually get those rents? Um, and, you know, you can look at data online, but there's nobody better to talk to than somebody who's actually involved in that day to day. So, you know, yep. they can give you a pulse on the market. Yep. And what about lender and broker? Um, yeah, the, the lender is obviously very critical as well. Um, those, you know, those are good relationships to, to develop. And then, you know, whenever you find a deal, uh, you've kind of got a few guys that are, are ready to go and eager to do the deal. But yeah, that's, I mean, that's critical. Before I even usually do anything on a deal, I run it by my lender um, because, you know, they're going to come to the table with 70% of the money. Right. And if they don't like your deal, they're, they're <laughs> not, they're not going to do it. So, um, you know, they, it's got to pass their sniff test first before you can really even get started. So I usually like to kind of get a head nod from the lender um, before I even start anything. And, and sometimes I'm pretty sure, you know, you are pretty smart and you have been doing this for a while, but sometimes, you know, they may have some ideas, right? And you may, you may have missed something from your own due diligence about that property or about the development. And they may bring up something which you may not even have even thought of, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, everybody makes mistakes and things can be overlooked. So to have as many people involved early on um, is better. So that way you can avoid some of those, some of those missteps. Yeah. The more, the merrier. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's just part of, part of building your network, like all these people, like I'm sure somebody that may be looking at development right now is like, well, I don't know any of those people. Um, you know, just build your network, get out there and meet people and ask for referrals. And, um, you know, you'll find over time that, that your network will start to pay off with, you know, great partners or investors, um, service providers and that sort of thing. So that's great. Um, thank you, uh, EJ. Uh, we'll take a break for a couple of minutes. I'm chatting with EJ Sansom out of uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, he's a developer slash attorney. So, and we were discussing about the team members you need to develop. So um, I understood about all the team members you need. How do you find and vet those team members for development? Yeah, I like to um, find my team members, usually through my network, a warm referral. Um, you know, if I don't have any clue where to look, I may, you know, try to find somebody online, but um, the best way to find people is, is through your network. So asking other real estate professionals, hey, have you, who have you used for you know, this or that service? Um, and usually you'll get some referrals and talk to people. And if they come highly recommended, you know, those are the people that you wanna to talk to. Absolutely, referrals are the best. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and then, you know, you, it's always good to refer business anyway. I mean, always ask for a referral first. Um, if you can't find it, then go elsewhere. But, you know, if, if somebody gets referred to you and you refer back, you know, it's just a great way to develop business. So um, I don't think we discussed about this, uh, but how do you um, anticipate the demand for that type of property? So what kind of due diligence you put into it, right, for the, on that land or the property? Um, to make sure that, you know, by the time you are done constructing, you know, this type of property, be it a commercial office building or an apartment building, uh, would have a pretty high demand. Yeah, so typically what you're going to do on a large commercial development project is you're going to 
you're going to commission a pretty robust um, market study. And, um, you know, you can kind of gear those in, in any which direction, but the market study um, is going to tell you whether or not um, the market analysis firm and, you know, there's many out there, some better than others, um, but they'll, they'll let you know whether or not the market is there. They'll, you know, if there's rent involved, they'll tell you um, what the estimated rents are. So then you can kind of tailor your, you know, your deal around that and make sure that the lender's comfortable with it, investors are comfortable with it. Um, but I mean, even before that, you, you know, you're going to do your own due diligence um, and just kind of seeing what, what the market can bring using the internet to figure out, you know, what the guy next door is charging for rent, that sort of thing. So that's great. So um, what are the gotchas of real estate development? Um, time and money. Those are, those are the two uh, biggest gotchas. Um, and then, you know, I would say that the first, the first key to development um, is making sure that, that you buy right. Um, you know, land can be expensive um, or land can be cheap. And, you know, land prices fluctuate wildly um, in different areas. And I mean, areas, everything, obviously, but, you know, the mark <clears throat> in a different market, um, you know, prices are higher in some and lower in others. So it's very hard just to look at a piece of land and know what it's worth. So, um, you know, you kind of got to back into, you know, what you can pay for land. Um, so you, you again, kind of do your market study and then figure out what you can pay for land based on, um, you know, what the market will bear. So just make sure you vet the land well. And then it, once you've moved the development forward, uh, you got to manage time. Uh, everything takes, takes longer than you think it's going to take. So right. If you think it's going to be nine months, you know, plan on 14. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, usually things run, run behind schedule and over budget. Right. And then <laughs> those, those getting costs start setting up, right? So, yeah, you put it right, time and money, you know, and the time, if it's going to take longer than you anticipated, of course, it's going to add up. Absolutely, yeah, because, I mean, the time, like you said, costs cost more with the carrying costs. You've got um, interest on, on your debt. Yeah. Um, all the time that you're not generating any revenues, money lost. So yeah, yeah. Time, so make sure you manage both well. Yeah, and you may have a construction loan or a bridge financing, which of course costs more anyhow, right? So you are you are waiting to refi after construction is done. So you are you are adding more and more to this. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So you're right, definitely. You know, especially on your loan, make sure you ask for for more time than you need. Those are some great advice. Any advice you want to give to a newbie or beginner starting to invest in real estate? Um, I guess my, my biggest uh, ad advice would be, I mean, just get started. Um, you know, a development project one doesn't have to be big. If you want to get into development, I mean, you can develop something small. Um, I talked about distressed assets. So, I mean, if you can find something that needs a lot of work and you can redevelop it, um, you know, that's, that's a great place to start and just kind of get a feel for real estate transactions and how deals work. And then, you know, just kind of piggyback off of each little win. Oh, thank you. So uh, this is a question I always think about because, uh, you know, I keep reading uh, Red Rich Dead Poor Dead and a lot of other books and they keep talking about our education system. Mm -hmm. And you're a successful attorney, developer, co-author of an Amazon best-selling book. What do you think about our education system? What should we be teaching our kids in high school and college? What we are not teaching right now? Uh, you know, I think that the, the, the core subjects are important. You know, math, science, those things are, are, are critical and it's good to develop those, you know, that, that knowledge base young, you know, and then you grow up into, into high school and, you know, then you kind of, I know I personally tuned out at that point, you know, I kind of just coasted. Um, um. <laughs> was waiting to, to kind of get started in life. Um, right. I think at that point, you know, we could definitely focus on, on um, more practical skills, business. I, I didn't have a single business class whenever I was in school and right. really, really didn't learn any business skills until, you know, I got beyond high school. So I think that we could definitely start that younger and that would have a huge impact. That's great. Anything else you want to share about real estate development, which we did not discuss? No, I think we got a pretty comprehensive over overview. Um, you know, another tip I would say if you're wanting to get started is, you know, re read a book. There's so many good books out there um, on developing and getting started in real estate. Um, so, 
you know, gobble up as much, as much information as you can and then just go for it. That's awesome. So how can my listeners reach out to you? Uh, you can contact me by my email, um, which is E Sansone, S A N S O N E at edgewater, R E C O.com. Thank you so much, EJ. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. It was, it was great uh, to chat with you today. Have a great day, everyone.